right, guys, on the fly is back again with another great interview. And guys, if you were a fan in the 80s of music, you heard it on the radio over and over again. Sister Christian, Sister Christian. But you didn't mind it. It wasn't overkill. Sister Christian, it still stands to this day, along with some great hits like, uh, you know, When You Close Your Eyes, Sentimental Street, Rock in America, Goodbye. And with me tonight is a member of the mega band Night Ranger. With me tonight is the guitarist, lead guitar, one of the lead guitarists. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, too, is Mr. Kerry Kelly, who has a who's who of music artists that he played with. I'm talking about Alice Cooper, Slash, Jamie Lane, Vince Neil, Pretty Boy Floyd, and a group that was short-lived. But, guys, I'm telling you, if you want a good kick-ass hard rock album, you need to listen to Saints of the Underground. Uh, and with me tonight, like I said, yeah. is Mr. Kerry Kelly. Welcome to the show, Mr. Kelly. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, Stevie, man, doing good. Thank you for having me, man. Well, thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. this. is This is big time for us. Uh, you grew up on the West Coast, Huntington Beach, California, right? Yep. So. Yep, that's it, man. California, baby. <laughs> so you were in the middle of that West Coast scene that really took off uh, in, in the 80s. What were, your, what were some of the groups you were listening to, your musical influences? Um. Well, you know, I I was a little bit younger than a lot of people, um, you know, so I was like hanging out with some of my, my friends, you know, the brothers were like three, four, five years older and things like that. And, uh, but, you know, Van Halen stuff in, in the late seventies um, and then the Aussie records came out, you know, we loved that. Um, I mean, just, I was soaking up everything. I mean, I was like, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, just going, man, this is awesome. So I was just kind of gravitating all over the place. And, uh, you know, speaking of, I know you said Saints of the Underground, just another little tag in, you know, Janie was obviously in the band from Warrant. And, uh, but down the street from my house, um, just on the other street, like a few houses down, Joey, the guitar player for Warrant lived right. over there. And, uh, so I've known him since I was like a little kid, you know, he's, I don't know exactly like maybe five years older than me, but his band would be jamming in their garage, you know, and I'd come by and listen, you know, it's a little kid and stuff, but uh, you know, the ties go long, you know, in, in Orange County in that LA scene. And I, I was just immersed in it, even though I was, you know, a little kid, you know, Motley when they were playing around LA, you know, I got a chance to see them. And I mean, all of it, man, it was just crazy. I was always just like this little kid that was hanging around. They were like, who is this little kid, you know? <laughs> yeah, I was a kid. I became a KISS fan when I was like five. And then later on, when I got to about 12 yeah. and 13, uh, I really got into a, a friend of my brother's had had an Aussie record. And I really got into the, the hard rock scene then. I, I had to have, uh, if, if I wasn't reading it at the grocery store, Circus, Hit Parader, uh, Metal Edge, I had to have oh, it. Yeah. I miss those days, though. I miss those days of those magazines. I know it's all online, but having a hard copy with me is, uh, you know, I really miss that. Yeah. So what was the first album? You yeah, those, you those, those were the days. Yes, they were. First album I I you. bought. Um, wow. I don't, I don't know exactly. You know, to be honest with you, uh, I know my parents really liked music a lot. You know, my dad played bass and stuff. And uh so they were always playing music around the house, you know, um, a lot of Rolling Stones um, and Johnny Winter stuff. Cause like my, like I said, my dad played bass. He was kind of into like power blues type stuff. Um, and then, but I remember the queen record news of the world. I think my mom bought it um, when it came out and we would listen to the, the, I mean, we wore that fucking thing out, man. And then my mom took me to that concert. I was like seven years old. Um, so wow. I got a chance to see him. It was amazing at the forum in LA. Yeah. Um, but so we play that and then, you know, and then kiss obviously came into my world at the same time, you know, and like I said, I was around the same age, like seven or eight years old. You're like, Whoa, look at these guys. What is this? Like superhero rockers, you know, you don't really know you're <laughs> such a little kid. You're like, well, what the fuck? But, uh, so I don't remember what record I actually bought with my own money, but I was listening to those records back then just cause my parents were really into it, you know, um, into music and, I know a lot of people I've talked to, uh, you know, or I know my friends 
that are musicians, you know, sometimes their parents weren't really into music, you know, so they kind of were on their own path in a way. But uh, my parents were always supportive and they were, you know, buying records and going to concerts themselves. So I was kind of like just tagging along, you know, I was lucky. Yeah, and I, I had I had some cool parents too. I was, uh, like I said, a big Kiss fan. They were buying me Kiss costumes, Kiss albums. I've got pictures at Christmas posing with Kiss Destroyer, uh, Kiss Alive at Easter. I, that was that was like my present every year was at, le- uh, at least one Kiss album. Um, so first band, yeah, first I love band it. you were in. Uh, back like in the old old days. Yeah, the first band you started. Oh man. Uh, this must have been when I was like thir- I guess probably about 13 or maybe 14. And, you know, I was still obviously just learning. We're just trying to get going and stuff like that. But it was a, a little band called Blinder. Um, okay. And it was kind of like a hard rock type of band. The singer guy was really into like Jeff Tate. I think it was around when Queens right came out. Like he was, a, he was older. He, again, I was like always a little kid. I was like this little kid guitar player and everybody in the band was like, you know, five or six years older than me. So, these guys were into like, you know, Priest, you know, with Alfred and, and then then the Jeff Tate vocals and stuff like that. So we were kind of playing that kind of music and we just play some backyard parties and stuff like that. And then, uh, you know, it didn't really last long. And then I, I, I joined another band that was starting and kind of just moved on and moved on. That band was called Empire after that. I'm sure, there's a million empires across the, the <laughs> globe, but this was, you know, back in the middle eighties, I guess, or something like that. But uh yeah, like I said, I was always a young guy in the band. Every band I've been in, I'm, I'm always like literally five or, well, and when I played with Alice, obviously much more years right. younger, but uh, I was always a little little kid guitar player. You know what I mean? Yeah, you, you and like I said earlier, you've got a who's who up here. I didn't really name all the people you've been. Vince Neil, John Waite, uh, Slash, Alice Cooper, and then there was a band that you started – 2013 yeah. Project Rock. Tell us a little bit about Project Rock. Oh yeah, that that was a <laughs> it was a cool band. So what that was is um a year or two before uh with Alice we were touring in in uh, Russia. We did a tour from east to west in Russia. It was like a month long tour and it was us and the Scorpions. Um, and I had known James, the drummer from the Scorpions for years prior anyway. So we were always hanging out, you know, cause it was a long tour and we had it, we had a 747 dude that we are traveling on. So it was us and the Scorpions and actually this other band called Rasmus, which is from Europe and stuff was on the tour as well. So, um, but the promoter, um, that does a lot of big shows in, 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 uh, Russia, he said, Hey man you guys should do like a super group thing and I'll be, I'll promote the shows and do this or whatever. So we said, okay, cool. Let's, let's do it. And so we just basically called up a couple of other friends and it was a, uh, it started off where we had a, uh, oh, I called up Tim, Tim Ripper Owens, you know, who was in priest. And I said, Hey, listen, do you want to do this thing over in, in Russia with, with, you know, me and James Kotek? And he said, yeah, let's do it. You know, who do you, who do you think on base? And I go, I don't know. I was thinking maybe I'll call up Rudy Sarzo. So I called up Rudy and he said, yeah, let's do it. I know the promoter's name was Ed Ratnikoff. And he goes, oh, I know Ed. I love Ed. Yeah, he's great. Let's let's do it for sure. And then uh, at one point, then we had Teddy Zigzag from Guns N' Roses playing with us as well. So we just went over there and um, and we basically just played a bunch of songs from each of our kind of respective bands. We played some Priest, you know, played some Ozzy stuff. We played some Alice with Scorpions, of course. And, uh, and the show, the reception was friggin awesome so we did that in like the fall and then we came back and did it in the spring they wanted to do it again and then we said hell this is going pretty good why don't we make a record so then we we made our own original record and at that point we kind of changed the name from project rock because we thought project rock sounded like it was just a jam band kind of um you know so we, we changed it to a new revenge and that a new revenge record that we put out a couple of years ago was basically just, you know, that band doing original songs that we wrote over a couple year period. And we recorded it basically at uh, mostly at my studio and Tommy Hendrickson's studio as well, who plays with Alice. And uh, and that's that. So that's Project Rock and which morphed into a new revenge. 
uh, Tim Ripper Owens, James Kotak, Rudy Sarzo, and myself. Well, what was it like playing with Alice? Awesome. <laughs> Alice is great. You know, I'm sure you've heard people talk about him. I mean, he's literally a, 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 a living rock legend. I mean, everybody knows it. Uh, one of the nicest dudes around um, has a catalog deeper than almost anybody. Incredible songs and uh, so easy to tour with and play with. I mean, it, it was, it was awesome, man. It was such an honor to be able to, to play with him and, uh, Everything was was great, man. It's like no complaints at all. It's like a big family over there. I actually was just talking to um, the production manager like about a week or so ago about some other things we were talking about tours and and their tour that was coming up. Like I think it's in September, he said. And uh, and everybody's still family over there. Great guys, and I know a lot of the guys obviously in the band, and uh, we talk a lot. And it's cool. I was just talking to the bass player the other day as well, like two days ago. So uh, yeah, everything's cool, man. Yeah. So before we talk about Night Ranger, I, and I've got to talk about this, like I said earlier, before we started recording, I was talking about Saints of the Underground. When I found out I had the interview with you and then found out you were in Saints of the Underground, I was like, well, dude, I've got to talk about this. Incredible album. We talked about it earlier. Love the Sin, Hate the Center with the great late Janny Lane, uh, Bobby Blotzer. And, yep. you know, yep. Talk about that album a little bit because a lot of people don't know. Like I said, I stumbled across it uh, on Apple, on Apple Music. And, you know, this is just a kick-ass album from start to finish. You've got some cover songs in there. One of them is American Girl from Tom Petty. But what was it like making that album? Uh, it was very simple, man. Uh, it basically how that thing came about, you know, not to rehash the same stories, but, you know, it was kind of like Project Rock. We had this jam band. It was the same four guys and we called it the underdogs. And this was like in the late nineties, like I think maybe 97 or 98 or something like that. And we would just go around jamming songs that we, we kind of love. Like we play a couple warrant songs or maybe a rat song, but we would play like Aerosmith and, and weird things, dude, like we would play like the vapors turning Japanese and all these, just whatever we wanted to. And then at one point, uh, we just decided to, to fucking make a record, man. And, and so it was very simple. You know, I, I have a pretty nice studio at my house, you know, good enough with drum set all mic'd up in the control room and the whole nine yards. And, uh, Janie and I were writing a bunch of songs at the time anyway, um, for solo stuff or warrant or whatever we didn't really know and um we mainly kind of just got together Janie and I and kind of wrote a bulk of the songs Bob gave, had a couple ideas that we kind of worked up um worked into the songs that we kind of had um and and that was it it was fucking really simple dude I mean we, we would work really fast Janie and I and uh Bob cut the drums he was living in Houston at the time he cut the drums at his studio and to be honest I mean Janie and I just cut all the rest of the stuff at my house, man. And, and then, um, and then it was done. It was very simple, very painless. And, uh, and, but I think the record came out awesome. And, and I think I'm very proud of it. Um, and I'm glad you got a chance to check it out or you're getting into yeah. it. And, uh, Janie was, Janie was great. I mean, I really love that guy and, uh, we got along great and we worked together really. I mean, it was so easy. Um, we probably put about 50 songs together. A lot of them are kind of in half finished stages still. I mean, there's probably 20 songs or, or so that are half completed that I have, but uh, yeah, but back to the record, Saints on the Ground, very cool project. And I was happy to be involved in it. I'm glad you you're into it too, man. Yeah. And I am talking to, to different people. I heard Janie was so, it was so easy for him to write songs that he could just whip one, you know, a song out in like, 50 minutes or less. Yeah. I mean, we would, yeah, we would do things. I mean, it would work in various ways. Sometimes he, he would go, Hey, I have this chorus or sometimes I go, Hey, I have this part of that part. We usually, we would have somebody, one of us would have a part, but yeah, dude, we would just knock the shit right out. I mean, literally we would have it together in, I mean, not necessarily a master, but we'd have it in like a demo state where you have verse pre-chorus chorus kind of thing in literally an hour and it'd be pretty damn good, you know? Um, 
so yeah, we worked together pretty, pretty, pretty easily. So it, it was an awesome experience. So like I said, I really missed that guy and uh, he was a great friend, man. Yeah. yeah, he was, he was a brilliant and a great singer too. Uh, let's get to the, to the main event, what we come here to talk about. How did Night Ranger come about? How did you come to join Night Ranger? I know you toured with them for a while, but how did that all come about before you became a permanent member? Um, yeah, it, it was just uh, kind of like the same old story <laughs> <laughs> you probably heard before. Maybe, uh, you know, um, actually, when I was playing with Alice, we played up in Canada uh, at a festival and um, Alice was the main band and they were playing, a, I don't know exactly on the bill, a band or two before, um, but we came down to the show and, and our other guitar player in Alice at the time, Damon Johnson, my buddy, he had known Jack um, prior because they were going to do some kind of a damn Yankees reunion at one point, I don't know when, but, uh, and I guess Ted uh, couldn't be involved. And so I think Damon was trying to get in there or something like that. Anyway. Um, so I, I met Jack then and Damon introduced me and we kind of just, you know, talked for 10 or 15 minutes, us all together. And that was about it. Um, and then a couple years later out of nowhere, um, Jack called me, I was out with John Wade actually, and said, Hey, Damon gave me your number, man. Uh, we need a guitar player. Can, can you, <laughs> can you play with us? And I, and I was like, yeah, when? And he goes, oh, it's going to be like in a couple of weeks because we have this tour. Our guitar player plays in Trans-Siberian Orchestra, but we got this tour with Journey. It was like, I think it was like a month run up in Canada or something like that. It was in Canada, but it was like a month run or three and a half weeks or something like that. And I said, yeah, I'd love to. And he goes, okay, great. We'll send you the songs or something like that. And, uh, and basically that's how it started. So um, I played with him that winter. Uh, because the other guitar player was doing the, the TSO thing, which usually lasts, I think it's like October, November, December kind of a thing. Then I played with them the next winter as well. And then that next following year, um, Joel, the guitar player, uh, got the offer to play with Whitesnake. And so then they just asked me if I wanted to obviously be in the band permanently, not just fill in during the TSO thing. So you know, whenever your phone rings, basically you just answer it because you never know who's on the other line. You know what I mean? One of the, one of the things I'm big fans of is is a dual guitar player, and uh, you and Brad Gillis. I, I, we're going to talk about the the new song that's a breakout in, in just a few minutes. Yeah, playing dual guitar solos is. I mean, it, it it's just like Rat used to do it with Demartini and. Uh, Robin Crosby, I was a big fan of that. Yep. It's just a different sound to me. What's it, you know, how do you guys decide, I mean, do y'all just play off each other when you're in the studio deciding to solos? Yeah, you know, um, that's one thing that I think is so great about this band, dude, the same, same thing you just now touched on. You know, one of my favorite bands uh, of all time is Thin Lizzy, you know what I mean? And, and these guys, were influenced by Thin Lizzy, obviously, you know, back when they were kind of really getting going in, in 81 and 82, um, that dual guitar harmony thing, you know, it's just so rad. And, and uh, you know, they kind of like embellished upon the, the Thin Lizzy theme of that. And uh, so it's so awesome to be able to play these lines with, with Brad that, I mean, the legendary lines from songs, but then the songs that we're creating as well. But yeah, it's, it's basically, we just try to come up with a cool theme um, you know, a melody line and start adding the harmonies and everything. But, but I think that that's a great part of this band. And like you mentioned rat as well. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to play with those guys. So doing the same type of thing with, with D Martini. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do. Like I said, the Finn Lizzie thing, a lot of guitar players like to be in a band, like, you don't want to be the main guy. I, hey, I'm yeah. the guitar player. I will not want a band with one, <laughs> one guitar player, man. I, I'm the man, you know, I'm kind of like the opposite. I think it's cooler to have two guitars. It sounds bigger, obviously. Yeah, you can do yeah. these cool harmony lines. You can play different guitar inversions to make the sound bigger. Um, so I've always just been a fan of like of two guitars and dual guitars, you know. Even if you want to go more on, on a metal side, um, you know, the innovators are talking like, you know, Iron Maiden, who was influenced by Thin Lizzy as well, you know. 
So I dig it, man. I, I love to be able to play these signature lines with Brad and the new lines that, that we're kind of coming up together, you know, with on the newer records. Right. And, and Brad Gillis is such a, a, you know, an awesome guitar player. People don't, a lot of people don't realize, you know, he did a little stint with Ozzy after Randy Rhodes. Uh, he's on that live album. Uh, yep. and, yeah. It, it, it's a, such a great guitar player. You know, you get to play with Jack Blades, Brad Gillis, and Kelly Keegy, who were guys that were, you know, so great watching on MTV and listening to when growing up. What are some of those great Night Rangers? What's the, your favorite, if there is one, Night Ranger song to play live? One of the classic songs. Oh, man. And, you know, just to back up, you are right. I mean, these these guys are, are great musicians and uh and great friends you know you, jack kelly and brad and uh you know and even the new keyboard player eric obviously right uh they love music they love music they love playing together you know you've heard about all the infighting in other bands i'm sure and all that nonsense i mean these guys actually like each other and, and, yeah. and love to play music together but uh um you know back to the, the songs i mean we play live i mean I love kind of playing some of the newer songs. We always play a song or two, like we're playing Breakout right now, the new record. We played it twice. It's always just fun to be able to play the new songs we're playing somehow, some way on uh, from the last record. But as far as the legendary staple songs, um, Don't Tell Me You Love Me is probably the main one that I love to play. Just the heaviness, it's in F sharp. If you're, if you're a musician, it has that cool, Thin Lizzy had a lot of songs in F sharp, so I love F sharp. Um, that's probably my number one. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the crowd, the big tearjerker is Sister Christian. And that's it is fun to play that live because the whole friggin crowd is singing and they're having a great time. You know, so that's a, a reaction is awesome. But as far as the, the guitar intensity and stuff, I'm going to go with, with Don't Tell Me You Love Me. That's awesome. That's an awesome song there. All right. Let's talk about the new album coming out August 6th and the band played on. You guys got yep. the single out. And I've, I've sat here and listened to it over and over. And like I said, one of my favorite parts of this new song, Breakout, is the dual guitar solos, like we just talked about. It's one yeah. of my favorite parts of the whole song. This is a, a rocking song, and it's just a great song. You, you guys, uh, what kind of reception? You said you played it in concert. What kind of reception are you guys getting on it? So far, it's been great, man. We played it twice, man. We... Uh... We played it last week and the and the week before, and uh, it's going over good, man. I mean, people are digging it because it's high energy, and like you said, it's got a shitload of those you know harmony guitars all over the place. So it's 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 rad, you know. And uh, yeah, it's been good. And and even though the song's kind of only been out for a few weeks now, I think people are taking to it, man. So that that's a good sign. You know, speaking of last week, and don't tell me you love me. Uh, we were playing. It was a very strange bill. Um, it was a festival and it was it was with like a band called All That Remains, a heavy band. Uh, Phil from Pantera was playing Limp Biscuit, believe it or not. And <laughs> uh, and Corey Taylor, dude from from Slipknot. He, he's he's such a, a great guy and a, right. a, a awesome musician. I, I love love every, everything that guy does. But uh, and, and, and Corey actually came out and jammed with us on Don't Tell Me You Love Me. It was awesome. I you know? I actually posted. They did. They had a video and a story on that. I actually posted that on my my Twitter on the on the fa on the, my Twitter and, and Facebook page about that. I did see that. Corey Taylor is one of those guys. He's just so talented, and he he can do just about anything. He can he can do hard rock, and then he'll he'll slow it down a little bit, and you would say that's not that can't be Corey Taylor. But yeah, Corey Taylor is so great. Yeah. Um, Oh yeah. Yeah. He's a, yeah. Incredible, incredible musician, uh, great guy, nicest fucking dude. And yeah, I mean, he can go any, like you said, he can go from slipknot to, to, to playing Stone himself style. an acoustic guitar. I mean, it's, it's awesome. And, and, you know, it, 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 he has appreciation for music. You know, a lot of people that are really into like say metal kind of are, are, have like tunnel vision a little bit there. If it ain't metal or if it ain't heavy yeah. as hell, then, you know, you're lame or whatever, but, I mean, dude, like at that show, he stood on the stage, dude, and watched our whole show. And then he come, came running out on Don't Tell Me. You know, it's, I, I don't even know what to say. You know, it's, it was awesome. So, yeah, I just remember seeing him when Prince passed away, him do the Purple Rain. And I was just like, 
wow, this guy's so talented. Uh, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> talk a little bit about being able to get back out on the road again. How has that been after this whole COVID situation pretty much took you off the road? And I know that's when you guys did a lot of the, the stuff with this album, but and that deals with a lot of what's on the band played on. Uh, but talk about being able to get out on the road again. Yeah, man. I mean, we're really ramping it up here. We've been playing a lot the last couple of months, you know, basically, you know, June and July, it started kind of coming back and we have dates that are all the way through October. We're pretty much booked, um, which is rad. Uh, you know, last year we only played a handful of shows. I, I think like eight shows or something like that during the, uh, the, the heavy COVID lockdowns. But, um, I mean, we're excited, dude. I mean, all the shows that we played here, that like I said, the last couple of months, people are coming out in droves and they're so happy to be able to hear music and be entertained and jump around or do whatever they do. And we're happy to, to play for them, you know? And uh, I mean, if you're not concerned and you want to come out to the show, we love to see you. You know, if you are concerned, then I guess you could stay at your house, but uh <laughs> It doesn't matter, but, uh, you know, we want to play for the people. And so far the reception has been incredible, man. I mean, it's, it's just been great. So we're, we're happy to be out here playing and entertaining the people, man. Yeah. I've got to ask you this question because this is something we've talked about on, on the podcast a lot. And I, I want to get your opinion on this. There's a lot of people saying they don't want guys, classic groups like Night Ranger to come out with new music. Uh, nobody wants to hear the new music from, you know, just, and but they'd rather hear the classic stuff. What do you think about when you hear it? Because I really, like, with ACDC came out with stuff, Alice Cooper come out with new stuff, that was, and both of those were great. And I'm dying to hear the rest of this Night Ranger album. But what do you think about when you hear people say, nobody wants to hear a classic group come out with new music? Yeah, you know, I don't really agree with that. I mean, I kind of think it's a, it's, it's lame. Um, you know, a lot of these bands, you know, like I said, I mean, heritage bands or legacy bands or whatever, like I said, they don't, they think, Oh, people only want to hear these first couple records or whatever. We don't need to do anything new. And I mean, our guys, you know, night Ranger and like you mentioned Alice or ACDC and hell dude, even though they don't release records that often, but even the freaking rolling stones, dude, 60 yeah. years later, they're still putting new music out. And I think it's a testament to guys liking to play music, play music together and or create art. You know, it's, I mean, music is a form of, of art. And uh, that's one thing that I think is great that, that we're able to do every few years. We're putting new records out, new product. And, uh, and it's fun to create music, I think. So I think it is, yeah, maybe you're not selling 10 million records like the old days, but uh, I mean, hey, it's an outlet. It's something that, I think should be done. And I think it's a bummer. Some bands that, that don't embrace that for whatever reasons. I mean, I'm, I'm not the boss of them, but uh, I'm proud to be able to, to be with guys that do want to create art and, and put some new music out for whoever wants to hear it, you know? Yeah, I agree. All right. Let's talk a little bit about, and the band played on what are, what are some of the songs? Of course uh, we break out is already out there. Uh, that's a great song. It's a high energy song. What are some of the, the songs that you're really excited about on this album? Uh, well, yeah, there's a lot of great cuts on the record. We actually uh, cut 14 songs. I, I think there's 11 on the yeah. American release. And I think, of, I think there's, the other ones are like special ones, like for Japan or for iTunes. Or, you know, it's always some kind of special little things. I don't know exactly everything about it, but... Uh, some of the songs I personally really like, I mean, obviously breakout is, is great. Kind of one of the lead tracks. Um, the first song on the album is all is called coming for you. And I think it's great, man. It's an incredible lead off cut. Um, so I think people are really going to get excited about that. Another cut called cold as December. Um, I really think it's, is awesome. Um, a song called hero, which is a ballad is an incredible ballad. Um, I believe. And, I think, I mean, I love all the songs you, cause you know, they're kind of like, you've worked on them for so long, they're ingrained in you, but, but those are some of the ones that, that I personally really love and, and, and I gravitate towards coming for you, a cold as December hero, great ballad and, and breakout is awesome as, as the lead track, you know, on, on the, 
as far as the lead, lead single, I guess you'd call it these days. Yeah, and I'm looking right now at where you can order, pre-order the, uh, and the band played on vinyl, yellow vinyl. I'm a big vinyl guy, and I'm getting back into vinyl. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh, gosh, my wife's going to kill me if I order this. But, uh, yeah, I'm seriously thinking about going ahead and ordering this vinyl. It's limited to 400 copies. If you guys are vinyl guys out there, go to the Night Ranger website at nightranger.com. Go to the store. You can see it there. It's limited to 400 copies, but it's pretty, pretty good-looking yellow vinyl up here. Um, you guys are going to – you said you're on tour. Yeah, I think I – Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, sorry, brother. I was going to say on the uh, on the records, I think that they're going to have like a few different versions. Um, I'm not sure, but I think there's like five different versions, like red, yellow, you know, green, clear, whatever. But yeah, I mean, vinyl is so rad. I mean, that's something that obviously I grew up with, you oh, know, yeah, and then they too. came out with the cassette. Or they had cassette, but, you know, you know, vinyl, cassette, and then obviously switch to CD. But uh you know, I have my record player and, and all that crap. And it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's so cool to have, have, have your own record, especially when they do the gatefold ones and you're like, wow, this is so cool, you know? Yeah. So it's rad. So we're, we're all very proud that they're doing all those custom uh, vinyls again. Yeah. And you get a bonus track on, on this vinyl too. Uh, uh, it's 11, 11 songs plus the bonus track is savior. Uh, that's on the CD and LP versions only. So uh, before we let you go, I got to ask you about this. Yeah. I'm a big craft beer guy. And I was reading that you, uh, yeah. Aces and Ales. Talk a little bit about, are you still with a, having the Aces and Ales? Absolutely, brother. Yeah, I started Aces and Ales, which is a uh, craft beer and scratch food restaurant uh, about 13 years ago. We have two locations in Las Vegas and we're building a third location right now, which is the same concept, but it also is a brewery as well. So it's, we're going to have, you know, like 50 draft beers and scratch foods, but brew our own beer there as well. Um, and it's called Aces and Ales because of we have games, you know, video poker, of course, you got to when you're in Vegas, right? Yeah. So that's the Aces part and, the, and then the Ales, man. But uh, yeah, I mean, how that started was, um, you know, I've been into craft beer for a long time. Some of my buddies in, in California and San Diego started companies back in the, in the nineties um, when it was not in fashion stone brewery and a company called ballast point, stuff like that. So I'd kind of been around it for a long time and it was weird dude in Vegas. There was like no craft beer really. Um, there was like a void in the market. So I just decided to, to start a place. So it, it took about a year to find the first location so it was about 14 years ago, actually. And then uh, we opened up and uh, we were like the grandfathers in, in, in Las Vegas now. Because, you know, nowadays you can buy craft beer at the friggin', you know, gas station. But back then there was really no craft beer around. So that's what we do. Like I said, all scratch food. You know, we have no freezers. Everything's made from scratch every every day. And uh, and like 50 uh, craft drafts. And, and then the brewery's on its way, man. But yeah, you can gravitate over to acesandales.com and you can check it all out. Yeah, we have we have a we have one around here, but with this COVID and with the workforce, it's it's not been able to be open at night. And I'm because they had the best chicken wings I've ever had. I'm a big chicken wing guy. They had the best wings ever, and the beer is great there too. Oh. But if I ever get out that way, I'm gonna definitely have to check out Aces and Ales. Um. Absolutely. Yeah. Mr. Kelly, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you guys, you guys are playing it in Minnesota tomorrow night. Yeah, man. Moon dance jam. It's a, it's a big festival out here. It should be awesome. I played here before with Alice and uh, we're looking forward to having a great time with the people, man. Well, yeah. I, if guys, if you get a chance to see night Ranger on the road this year, go out and do it. And by all means, August 6th, Get your copy of And the Band, Band Played On, whether it's digital on Apple's iTunes, buy the vinyl, the CD, or whatever. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, and the Band Played On from Night Ranger coming out August 6th. Mr. Kelly, thank you so much, guys. And I'll be watching you guys, checking out what you guys are doing, and can't wait to hear the album. 
Awesome, man. Thank you for having me, Stevie. Have a good night out there. And, uh, and yeah, pick up the record. Check out acesandales.com, nightranger.com. Got everything on there. And uh, look forward to seeing all the people out there rocking this year. All right. Thank you so much, guys. That is Kerry Kelly from Night Ranger. You still got